Welcome to the presentation for Nursing 150. This presentation will discuss care of the patient with urinary disorders. For this presentation, we will kind of review the assessment of the renal and urinary system. It's one of my favorite systems to talk about, actually. I think it is a system that does not get enough respect because it does a lot of multi multitasking and it um, does a lot of functions that really um, make the body maintain homeostasis and maintain its electrolyte, fluid and electrolyte balance. It plays a part in urinary elimination and acid base balance of the body. So huge part, huge um, multitasking going on here by the urinary system. So we'll talk about that as we go about this module and discuss any what disorders of this urinary system mean to the patient. I just want to take a second to point out a few major um, nursing teaching that goes along with taking care of a patient with urinary system disorders. Um, again, along with this multitasking thing, we need to talk to the patient about adequate fluid and electrolyte intake. So make sure you ha you have an understanding. This supposed to be an and um, of you know how much fluid is is a good amount of fluid. Typically, we're talking one to two liters liters per day, um, unless it's contraindicated for some other comorbidity or or other health problem. Um, but good fluid intake. Typically, when we talk about fluid intake, we're not talking about a liter of soda. We're talking about a liter of water. Water is a major um, piece of keeping urinary health. You know, we'll talk about this a lot more as we talk about urinary disorders. Fluid intake of good quality fluid intake is very, very important in maintaining the health of the urinary system. Um, teaching about... Uh, cleaning the perineum and the urinary meatus appropriately is a major piece of, of this as well. So cleansing, um, we'll talk a lot about that, about how to prevent infection by doing proper cleaning and proper hygiene. Uh, teach the patient about to, how to protect the kidneys and urinary system from toxic substances. We've talked about this a little bit in class, but we'll continue to talk, talk about this. There are medications that are metabolized in the kidneys, so we have to be very careful that we're not overloading the kidneys with these toxic substances. Um, so those can cause urinary disorders, so we'll, we'll talk about how to avoid loading the kidneys with these toxic substances. So again, in review of the anatomy and physiology of the urinary system, it's important to remember that the kidneys maintain health in many ways. The most important ways are fluid balance, body fluid volume. They filter waste products and elimination. The kidneys also help regulate your blood pressure and acid base balance. So lots of important jobs here that we put on these little beans that we call kidneys that sit in your um, peritoneum. So. Um, another function of the kidneys that a lot of people don't know is that they actually produce something called erythropoietin, which um, supports red blood cell synthesis. So again, very important jobs of the kidneys and the renal system. So it's important to review the organs and where they sit and the structures of the urinary system. So I'm going to try to attempt to draw this So as we go along here. So... I'm going to actually try to make these a bit color-coded. And this is mimicking the picture that's in your book, so you can use that as, as a um, resource as well. You have a renal artery and a renal vein. Renal vein is in blue, renal artery in red, just to kind of duplicate the color of the blood. Um, they do bifurcate off into the femoral arteries here. Um, but this comes down through the um, abdominal 
cavity here. And then you have, of course, your, your kidneys on each side. I'm not a very good artist, but I'm trying here. Your kidneys set behind the peritoneum. So they are not in the abdominal cavity. They are actually behind it. And they sit in kind of your lower portion of your back or your flank area is what it's commonly called. We could really go on all day about the function of the kidney and how they filter um, waste from the body. It is a, we could spend an entire class and a half probably on it. So you've had this anatomy and physiology, so I'm going to kind of leave it up to you to kind of review it to make sure you have some understanding of the function of the kidney. It's role is to eliminate waste from the body and it, in doing that it helps to regulate fluid and electrolyte balance and in doing that it helps to regulate acid base balance as well so that's why it's very important remember we are always trying to maintain homeostasis in the body that means we're trying to we're trying to maintain a balance of fluid we're trying to maintain a balance of acid base things like that so the kidneys play a huge role in maintaining homeostasis. Um, so we'll move on and we'll talk about a few more organs of the body. You know, these kidneys filter the urine and then the, they have these ureters that go down. Again, I'm not a good artist. You have a ureter from each kidney that takes the waste, which is also known as urine, down to the bladder. And then the bladder... Um, that's where it leaves the body. That's where the waste leaves the body or the urine leaves the body. So we want to maintain, this is kind of what I think is very important about this whole system. The system is meant to eliminate. So fluid should go out. If ever fluid is blocked from moving out for any reason, that's when a problem occurs. Any kind of a backflow of that waste product if it goes up rather than out, that's a problem. Anything that obstructs it, and we'll talk about this throughout this module, you know, there's kidney stones, things like that, that may obstruct the flow of urine out, then if that happens, that causes a problem. Any of this, any of this stasis or sitting around of this waste product known as urine um, is a medium for bacteria and that can cause an infection in this urinary system. And that's really what our role as a nurse is, to prevent any kind of um, infection from developing. If it does develop, we need to identify it early and treat it appropriately early so that it doesn't become a major infection that could really damage the kidneys. Here's a way better picture than the one that I just drew. <laughs> and it's just um, a reminder of the important structures of the urinary system that play a huge role in the part of eliminating the urine out of the body to rid the body of waste and to maintain homeostasis. This is just a reminder of how to assess a patient's um, urinary function. Major, think about what those major things are. Major questions you would ask your patient, you know, eyes and O's, are you, is your bowels and bladder working appropriately? It's important to get a history about any kind of history of kidney damage, any diseases that might affect the kidneys, any events, um, any past family history. Do they have a family history of any kidney disease? What well, medications? Medications is kind of um, important here because there are many medications that can damage the kidneys um, because they are metabolized in the kidneys. So it's important to look at medication intake, nutritional intake, eyes and O's. What kind of fluid do they take in? Do they take in a lot of caffeine? Do they just drink soda all day long? We know that that actually is caffeinated. A lot of the sodas are, so that's actually taxing on the kidneys because that actually makes you urinate more. So um, just think of the pieces of the risk factor assessment and the history assessment that we need to do on a patient to determine if they're at risk for developing any urinary problems. So I have this term costovertebral tenderness in red in this slide for a purpose. It's important to be able to identify a patient who has 
a bladder infection versus a kidney infection. Costovertebral tenderness is related to assessing a patient for pain in the flank region, especially in the area of the costovertebral angle. The costovertebral angle is located between the lower portion of the 12th rib and the vertebral column. There's some pictures in this uh, presentation that shows assessment of the costovertebral tenderness. Essentially what you're doing is palpating the kidney. If you are palpating the kidney and they are having a large amount of pain in the kidney, then the kidney is involved in the infection, in the infection that is occurring. Here's the whole um, issue with this. If somebody has a bladder infection, it's pretty easy to treat. That means that the infection has probably entered through the urethra um, for whatever reason and gotten into the bladder. We can treat it with some antibiotics. It's gone. Good. But when an infection travels all the way up the urinary system through the urethra to the bladder to the ureters to the kidney, that means it's traveled way up and now it could actually damage the kidney. We don't want infection to get way up to the kidney. Again, it goes back to that thing where we have to identify problems early on and treat them appropriately early on to prevent them from causing a major problem. Any infection that gets up into the kidneys can actually um, have a, an effect on the filtering ability of the kidney. We don't want that to happen because we already talked about how important the kidneys are. If we have some damage that occurs due to some kind of an infection, we know that that could affect homeostasis. So. Um, this cost of vertebral tenderness that you'll hear about throughout this module is determining whether a patient has developed a kidney infection versus just a bladder infection. As with all the body systems, we will learn throughout this semester that aging has an effect on the normal function of most of our organs it's good to review that because your older 68 year old patient versus your 18 year old patient is going to have a different, um, a, you know, it's going to have a different thought process as far as nursing care. An 18 year old's urinary system naturally is going to be way more healthy than a 68, 70 year old patient. Naturally, as we grow older, this reduced blood flow, this thickened glomerular and tubular basement membranes just decreases the function of the kidneys just by just by aging. So it's important to just kind of make note of that. Um, one other thing that to make note of is that an older person is at risk for dehydration. So fluid intake, fluid intake, fluid intake, unless it's contraindicated by some other disease process, water always, they need a good um, amount of fluid intake every day to hydrate them because they're at higher risk for dehydration. Whenever someone's dehydrated, that means that um, the pH of their urine is more acidic, they're more concentrated urine. That medium is a great medium for the growth of bacteria. Bacteria loves that stuff, so that's why it's good to keep the urine um, less concentrated. And the other thing about good fluid intake is it keeps the flow of urine going out rather than backflowing. Remember we talked about it's meant to be a one-way system, it's out. So the flow of water, a good continuous flow of water will help flush those kidneys out and flush that bladder out of any bacteria that might appear. So we do have some common diagnostic tests that can help us assess the function of the urinary system in a patient. Urinalysis, uh, typically pretty common that we can do, pretty, pretty um, easily done, pretty cheap. Um, so we do that a lot. Uh, basically, ideally, we want to collect a urine specimen in the morning. First, the patient's first voiding is typically helps us to assess uh, their urine function, their urinary function. It's important to understand what a urinalysis tests for, and there's a great chart in your book, in your Iggy book, your med surge book, that um, 
really just goes through everything that a urinalysis tests for. Looks at the color, the specific gravity, which means it kind of helps us determine how dilute urine is. So it kind of helps us determine whether the patient is hydrated well or not. pH, which you kind of you've learnt, heard about before, that tells us if it's acidic or not. Um, and there's glucose and ketones and protein and white blood cells and nitrates and all of those things that we can detect with a urinalysis that can give us some um, identification of what might be going on with the patient. It can help us diagnose for a urinary tract infection. So it's a good thing to um, be familiar with a urinalysis. The urine culture and sensitivity. So usually if we identify on a urinalysis that there are are some abnormalities, especially if there's leukocytes um, or white blood cells, especially if there's nitrates, especially if there's some blood in the urine. We will go ahead and look at a urine culture, which will culture um, and isolate a specific bacteria that might be causing these elevated white blood cells, these nitrates, these this blood in the urine and it might help us to explain maybe some patient's symptoms of a urinary tract infection. Urine culture and sensitivity takes um, another day or so to run. Urinalysis can be done like immediately. So usually if the urinalysis is abnormal, we will send it for a culture and sensitivity. The culture and sensitivity tells us uh, it can isolate a bacteria and tell us what the bacteria is sensitive to as far as antibiotics. So they're very helpful in the treatment of a urinary tract infection. It's important to understand when to collect a urine culture. We want to make sure that we would collect that urine prior to administering any kind of antibiotics. So if a, a provider might suspect a urinary tract infection, they might go ahead and order an antibiotic. If they order an antibiotic, a urine, a urine culture and sensitivity, we want to go ahead and collect the urine and then start the antibiotic. It, it keeps us from skewing the results of the urine culture and sensitivity. The, the sensitivity piece of it is the big part of it. 24-hour urine, sometimes we collect that. That helps us to identify how much the kidneys are filtering and how effectively they are filtering waste from the body in a 24-hour period. That's for somebody we suspect has kidney damage that is beyond a urinary tract infection. So if we think there is some significant kidney malfunction, we will do a 24-hour urine. Typically, the urine culture and sensitivity and the urinalysis are clean catch. So the patient, we have instructions on how to cleanse from the front to back, typically, um, for a female patient, for sure. And I, just as I just mentioned, female patient, I want to bring up the point that Female patients are at higher risk for developing urinary tract infection, and that is simply due to the anatomy. The urethra, the distance between the urethra and the anus um, is way shorter than for a male, so the likelihood of contamination is much higher in a female, so they are just more at risk. Other people who are more at risk are females who are menopausal, Estrogen, again, it's because of the loss of estrogen. Estrogen does a lot of great things for females as they um, are younger. As they become menopausal and lose that estrogen, they lose that protection. Estrogen helps to maintain pH levels in the patient's urine that fights off bacteria. Once the estrogen is gone, they have that, they lose that defense mechanism and they become more at risk for developing urinary tract infections. These are blood tests that are used to help us diagnose a patient's kidney function. Serum creatinine, which is listed here, is produced when muscle and other proteins are broken down. Protein breakdown is constant. The serum creatinine level is a good indicator of kidney function. Serum creatinine levels are slightly higher in men, in men than in women because men tend to have a larger muscle mass than do women. It's important to remember that the serum creatinine level will not elevate until at least 
50% of the kidney function is lost. So any elevation in serum creatinine values is important. A serum blood urea nitrogen is used in connection with the creatinine. Blood urea nitrogen measures the effectiveness of the kidney excretion of urea nitrogen, which is also a byproduct of protein. Urea nitrogen is produced mostly from liver metabolism. The kidneys filter urea nitrogen from the blood and excrete it in the waste. So if, it's, if, it, if the blood levels of creatinine and blood urea nitrogen are high, that means that the kidneys are not getting rid of it as well as it should. So if both of these are elevated together, that indicates poor kidney function. These are listed in your um, med surge book as well, these two labs um, in your chapters that are identified for urinary um, patients with urinary problems. The normal lab values are also posted there. The one thing to remember is that here's how these two work together. Your BUN or your blood urea nitrogen level can be affected by um, the patient's hydration status. So sometimes it can be elevated and the creatinine be normal. So basically if you look at an elevated blood urea nitrogen with a normal creatinine, that is telling you that the patient is probably dehydrated. As you can kind of see in this little explanation here, hopefully you can read that pretty well. But if the, um, the bun is elevated and the creatinine is elevated, that means there is a kidney problem. We'll discuss this a little bit more in class, but hopes that, hopefully that kind of helps you understand what we look for in the BUN and the creatinine. They both must be elevated together to indicate kidney function problems. If the BUN is only elevated on its own and the creatinine level is normal, that means that somebody, um, the patient has a hydration status issue. They're usually dehydrated in that situation. This is a little more explanation of a creatinine clearance test we might do on a patient's urine. Again, these creatinines should be cleared by the kidneys. If the blood or the serum is building up in levels of creatinine and the, there's not much in the urine, that means the patient is retaining and they're not filtering like they should. So that's how we use it as an identifier of kidney function. Urine osmolarity and specific gravity help us to identify the hydration status of a patient. Osmolarity measures the concentration of particles in a solution. So if the osmolarity is high, that means there's a lot of particles. That means it's a concentrated urine. Normal range for urine osmolarity. So again, we're talking about the particles in urine um, that concentrate the urine. So urine osmolarity can vary from 50 to 1400, depending on the patient's hydration status and kidney function. An average fluid intake will, should make the urine 300, around the 300 to um, 900 range, so right around here. So that's basically telling you how many solutes as opposed to fluid are present. Again, helping us to identify the patient's hydration status. If we're down here, that means that there's no solutes in this urine. It's all fluid. That means the patient may be overloaded. If we're down here, that means we got all kinds of solutes in that urine, and so it's concentrated. And so the patient will be dehydrated. They have more solutes than they do fluid. So that's how the, this test helps us to identify the hydration status of our patient. Specific gravity is a test that is very similar. It can tell us about the weight of the particles in the urine. So the higher, that means there's more particles. The lower, there's less particles. Somewhere in the middle is where we want to be. This would mean overload of fluid. This would mean not enough fluid. So very similar test, um, and it just helps. Sometimes it might not be a kidney problem. Maybe it's just a hydration thing. Um, again, back to a couple slides, I talked about fluid intake is huge in a lot of patients. We need to make sure they're getting enough fluid intake because sometimes if they're dehydrated, that could be the problem. That's why your kidneys aren't 
flowing through and the fluid isn't flowing through. They're not able to get rid of the, the waste because you don't have a good flow of fluid through the body. So we've talked about um, urine tests, we've talked about blood tests, so now we're going to talk about some more um, common diagnostic tests, mostly talking about ultrasound or x-ray to help us identify a patient with a urinary problem. A KUB x-ray is an x-ray of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, thus KUB. Um, it's a plain film of the abdomen, no specific prep, it's just an x-ray up to make sure that they're not pregnant, but otherwise it's very painless, it's just taking a picture. And it tells us the gross anatomy of the kidneys. Um, larger than they should be or, um, you know, is there any anatomic reasons why this patient has any of the symptoms that they have? That's typically what we use a KUB for. Um, the intravenous uh, urography or cystoscopy are a bit more invasive than the, the KUB. A cystoscopy is an endoscopic procedure it requires completion of a pre-op checklist, assigned informed consent. Again, it's way more invasive than an x-ray. A urologist um, provides a complete description of and reasons for the procedure. A cystoscopy also may be used to remove bladder tumors. Um, so basically, it's a scope where they go in through the urethra and take a look at the bladder. Cysto is referring to the bladder. So they go in and look to see if there's any kind of anatomic issues, tumors, um, especially in males, the enlarged prostate gland, to see if those are the problems with a patient causing decreased urinary output. Um, these are patients who typically are getting a lot of urinary tract infections, a lot of bladder infections, and we can't identify why so we are going to do a little bit more extensive testing to identify if there's an anatomic reason why the patients are getting these infections. Bladder scanner is an ultrasound. The PCAs on the floor right now, especially trained PCAs can do bladder scans. These are great little tools so we always try to avoid placing a catheter in a patient's bladder if we don't have to because we all know that that's an avenue for um, introducing germs for an infection. So bladder scanners can identify if a patient hasn't urinated maybe for 12 hours. We can look and do a little ultrasound of their bladder to determine whether there's even urine in there. If there's a bunch of urine in there and they haven't voided in 12 hours, we need to straight cath them. We need to pull that fluid out or else they're going to end up with a big urinary tract infection because there's this urine sitting in there and for whatever reason they can't urinate. But if they haven't um, urinated for 12 hours then um, and there's no urine sitting in their bladder, we know that they're probably dehydrated because they're not getting enough fluid to make them urinate if there's no fluid sitting in their bladder. That's how a bladder scanner has become a very effective tool in helping us to identify patients whether they need fluid or whether they need a catheter. It is preventing a lot of unneeded catheterizations on the floors and preventing urinary tract infections. Here's a picture of a sample of a bladder scan. Um, I don't know that these are on the floors or that where you'll be doing clinicals. They're similar to that. Here's what I want you to know about this. This is a very simple test that you can do, but you can only do it with the um, support of your instructor or the support of the staff on the floor. Um, they're getting higher tech each day, so everybody needs to be trained appropriately in doing. It's a non-invasive test. It's very easy to do, but you have to be trained correctly in order to be able to perform the test. So a, you, uh, like I said, um, the PCAs or the patient care assistants can do it, but they have to be specially trained. They have to have gone through the training on how to do that so we get accurate readings on these. Okay, great question here. So we have a patient who has a history of kidney disease. They're admitted with acute shoulder pain. 
which order should we question? Say, hey, doc, are you sure you want to do this? Because did you notice they have some kidney disease? So digoxin is a drug for the, your heart. It helps regulate your heart rhythm and everything. I don't even think that would be appropriate for shoulder pain. Metoprolol um, is another drug for your heart and your blood pressure. Not even appropriate for shoulder pain. Pan cultures for temperature. So that's an elevated temperature. Pan cultures, your patient doesn't even have that. Your patient has pain. So ibuprofen, 800 milligrams by mouth every four hours is needed for pain. That's a lot of ibuprofen. I would question that. If you look back and look at ibuprofen, it is metabolized through the kidneys and it is kind of taxing on the kidneys over time. 800 milligrams of ibuprofen is a lot. Uh, an Advil, that maybe just to put it in perspective, an Advil is um, 200 milligrams of ibuprofen. So that's a heavy dose of ibuprofen. I would question that. Shoulder pain, we can maybe give them one or two ibuprofen, which would be 400 milligrams lower dose. We don't want to hit them with 800 for pain because they have kidney disease. So they can they have ibuprofen? Sure, but we don't want to give them the highest dose possible. We want to give them a dose that is, you know, the lowest dose that would effectively treat their pain. We don't want to start out with 800 milligrams. So actually, this is your answer right here. So just looking at the bladder, um, as we go through the next few slides, we'll talk about a um, infection of this bladder. So we know this bladder is like a little muscle. We rely on it a lot as nurses to be able to hold a lot of urine in it. So it's the end, end place where the urine sits and is eventually expelled throughout the urethra of the body. So a urinary tract infection can be describing a infection anywhere along the urinary tract. Typically it starts low and moves its way up. Urethritis is talking about an infection of the urethra. Cystitis is talking about the bladder. And prostatitis in a man is talking about the prostate. Risk factors. So I think I already mentioned that women are at higher risk for developing a urinary tract infection, especially urethritis and cystitis due to the anatomic location where it is a closer to the, um, to the anus where they can contract E. coli. This is just due to poor hygiene. Women should wipe front to back, north to south, always. Because if they wipe um, the other way, they're going to wipe that E. coli from the anus to the urethra and cause a urinary tract infection. It's just anatomy that plays a part here. Men have, um, their urethra is naturally longer and it's further away from the anus, so that's why they just don't typically get them as much. A couple other things to think about with women. Um, multiple sex partners, multiple sex um, situations can put them at risk um, for a urinary tract infection. They need to urinate before and after any kind of a sexual encounter that helps to wash out any kind of germs that they have been exposed to. So younger women typically with multiple sex partners, multiple sex um, situations are at high risk for developing a, um, a urethritis or cystitis. Young men as well who have been exposed to multiple sex partners um, multiple times are at risk for developing a, a urethritis as well. So it's important, again, women urinate before and after any kind of sexual encounter. Those are ways to prevent urinary tract infection. So kind of covering this little section here, the risk factors. Other risk factors involve um, poor hydration, any kind of urinary retention as we grow older, any um, anatomic issues as far as blockages like um, BPH, which is benign prosthetic hypertrophy, any swelling of the prostate in older men can put them at risk for urinary tract infection, poor PO intake of fluids, 
any kind of dehydrating issue can cause a risk factor for urinary tract infection. Big key question here, uncomplicated versus complicated urinary tract infection. I already touched on it a little bit. A bladder infection that can be treated with an antibiotic quickly is an uncomplicated. It becomes complicated when it involves the kidneys, basically. The patient is way more sick when it involves the kidneys. The kidneys, any type of infection that um, goes up to the kidneys can cause a decrease in the ability of the kidneys to filter. So that's a much more complicated urinary tract infection. Again, the patient appears way more sick. They have a higher temperature. They have costovertebral tenderness, which means they have tenderness at their flank pain. Um, they're developing kidney um, issues. Your cystitis is an inflammation of the bladder, which is like I kind of just talked about. It's sometimes related to um, sex. It's sometimes it's related to other poor hygiene issues. Um, usually it's caused by bacteria moving up the urinary tract to the, to the bladder. Catheters are one of the major causes of a cystitis. That's where we've inserted a catheter through the urethra up to the bladder and we've um, introduced a bacteria if we didn't use proper procedures in placing the catheter. That's why we don't put a lot of catheters in, in patients anymore used to be everybody in the hospital had to have a catheter, but we don't do that as much anymore because we run the risk of developing a cystitis, which can eventually develop into a, a kidney infection if we're not careful. Here's some common signs and symptoms of cystitis. They start to have kind of a frequency, painful urination, feeling like they're going all the time. Um, we can do that urinalysis to look for any leukocytes, any nitrates in their urine to determine if they have a, bowel, a, a bladder infection. Again, like I said, the very important part of this is to identify it early and treat it appropriately. This is where this organism type confirmed by urine culture comes in very handy. We need to know what kind of organism it is, and we should treat it with the right antibiotic and treat it well. What you are going to begin to learn in Nursing 150 is the nursing education that comes with a patient who has been um, prescribed antibiotics. A patient that has been prescribed antibiotics needs to take it as ordered. They need to take it for as long as it's been ordered. If it's two times a day for seven days, they need to take it two times a day for seven days. If, because a lot of times what happens is they take it for four days and they feel better, so they quit. But there is this thing called a resistance that's being built up against our antibiotics that we have to fight germs, and we're ending up with these super bugs. These super bugs are able to um, kind of make their way through our current antibiotic system, and we can't treat them. So... And that's developing because people are not taking antibiotics as ordered and for as long as they're ordered. When you start to feel better, you still have to take them. You still have to take them for the amount of time that they have been ordered in order to make sure that you don't end up with some kind of a super infection. Urinary tract infections are typically diagnosed with a UA and culture insensitivity. A pretty, I think we've pretty much covered that. You get that urine, you send, if you identify that there are some blood, leukocytes, nitrates in that urinalysis, you send it for a culture insensitivity. That culture insensitivity is going to tell us exactly the bug that has caused this urinary tract infection so we can treat it with the appropriate antibiotic. The treatment has to be identified. You know, there's a lot of things. If a patient can't take an antibiotic, we need to determine if they have some kind of a allergy or whatever um, to an antibiotic, but we need to make sure that the bug is treated, the bacteria is treated with the appropriate antibiotic that will get rid of it. Um, nursing care, increase fluid intake, unless otherwise contraindicated, to flush out that urinary tract, get that flow moving forward out of the body. Adequate um, rest and, and nutrition as well. 
Urosepsis is um, a very serious um, infection that can be a result of a urinary tract infection that has not been identified and treated well. So it's basically a very severe urinary tract infection that has developed into sepsis, which you may or may not have heard of. Sepsis um, is a is essentially a infection that has traveled to the bloodstream and has causes the patient to be extremely sick because now it kind of it affects the entire body because this bacteria is being um, spread throughout the body in the bloodstream. This is called urosepsis. The urinary tract is a common cause for urosepsis. So it's in 10% of 30% of case, 10 to 30% of cases are caused by urinary tract infection. The you know, patients that this typically develops in are older patients um, who cannot, for whatever reason, due to dementia and incontinence, are unable to communicate that they are having any signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection, and so it is not identified and treated in time, and so the bacteria is able to travel into the bloodstream and cause the patient to be very, very sick. Um, sepsis affects all, uh, can lead to organ failure and shock. It's called septic shock, which would um, lead the patient to be placed into a, an intensive care unit and, and, again, very, very sick. So it's important that we are able to identify signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection early in order to prevent urosepsis. The best way to prevent urosepsis is to prevent a urinary tract infection, especially in these older adults that are at higher risk. So those are things like hydration, proper hygiene, um, monitoring their risk factors, looking um, for signs and symptoms of dehydration, looking for medications that might put them at risk, things like that. So again, really the key here for urosepsis is prevention of it and early, early identification and early intervention if possible. Pyelonephritis is another very serious infection that can be related to a urinary tract infection. Pyelonephritis is um, referring to the infection of the kidney. It's very dangerous to have infection of your kidney. We talked about early on how important your kidneys are, all the things that they do for us. So if they get infected, it can alter their filtration status and their ability to rid the body of waste, their ability to maintain fluid balance, and their ability to maintain our homeostasis. So we don't want them to get infected. A couple of different reasons why this can happen. Um, one of the most common is that you know someone could get like a cystitis or a bladder infection and it travels up and before we identify it and treat it appropriately it's able to travel up to the kidneys. Um, so that's one cause. Another cause is um, possibly a reflex or upward flow of urine instead of outward. So there might be an anatomic problem that is not letting the urine flow and it's getting backed up into the kidneys and the urinary tract. Kidney stones, which we'll talk about, are one um, common cause of maybe a blockage of the urine flow. So that could, if that reflex and that blockage of the urine flow will um, maybe cause some bacteria to be able to grow in that urine that is not flowing through. It is sometimes categorized as an acute pyelonephritis or chronic. Acute pyelonephritis simply means there's an active bacterial infection. Chronic pyelonephritis results from repeated or continued upper urinary tract infections. Acute pyelonephritis um, usually results from bacterial infection with or without obstruction. Chronic pyelonephritis usually occurs when structural deformities or urinary stasis or obstruction occurs. 
This is straight from your book, this picture is, and it's just um, just a visual picture of the pathophysiology of pyelonephritis. You do have um, some charts in your chapter in your medical surgical book about um, the key features of pyelonephritis. They, and it's important, the next question on the slide here is how do they differ from a typical urinary tract infection? It's important for us to know that because we need to know when we're dealing with more than just your typical urinary tract infection. Um, the patient typically appears way more sick. They um, will have higher fever, chills, tachycardia. They, the big thing that they develop is flank pain. So that flank pain is when you do that costo vertebral angle um, assessment where you press down towards um, the lumbar spine there. When you do that assessment, they have pain. That's flank pain. That's um, Your typical bladder infection will not have flank pain. They will have, think about what they'll have. They'll have frequency, urgency, um, and burning with urination. A patient with pyelonephritis will develop that plus high fever and flank pain, especially if it's due to the fact that they've had a urinary tract infection that's not been treated. So if they, the patient with pyelonephritis does look a little bit different than a patient with your average urinary tract infection. Um, this means that the bacteria has now invaded the kidneys and is affecting the kidneys, so they appear way more sick. They are they they can be nauseous and vomiting. They can you know be very fatigued, um, night nocturia, which means they're going to the bathroom a lot at night. So think about the assessments to where you're trying to identify what kind of a urinary, where in the urinary tract is the patient's infection. So you'll, you'll assess them, ask them where their pain is. Um, just for example, um, as a provider working in a clinic, if a patient comes in and says, I think I have a urinary tract infection. So we begin to ask them, okay, why do you think that? They say, um, I have burning on urination and I feel like I have to go all the time. Okay. That does kind of sound like something's going on. So our next question is, have you had a fever? And, do you, and then we'll assess for flank pain, which is assessing that cost over vertebral angle for pain. If they do have flank pain, we are going to be very concerned because we're going to be concerned that their kidneys have been affected. The other thing that we'll look at is we'll check their temperature. You know, do they have a temperature of 104? Um, and are they vomiting? What other symptoms go along with it? If they are, you know, if they have flank pain, a high fever, and they're nauseated and vomiting, we're going to act very, very, very quickly in getting them possibly IV antibiotics because it sounds like the um, infection has invaded their kidneys, and we need to get that treated before they get damage to their kidneys. Here's a picture of that assessment for palpating the kidney to determine whether they it's tender or if they have pain in that area. This is the costovertebral angle that you're assessing, and you're assessing for costovertebral tenderness, which would indicate that the, an infection has now invaded the kidney and the patient has pyelonephritis. As opposed to a patient who would not be, if there's no pain here, if there's no tenderness, we're going to treat them um, as if they have a lower urinary tract infection, which could be their bladder um, or their urethra. So treatment is a little bit different because um, it's not as severe when it's in the lower portion of the urinary tract and it's easier to treat. This is a practice question for you to assess your learning. Um, the answers can be found in the comment section of the posted PowerPoint that goes along with this voiceover. I mentioned kidney stones um, earlier when talking about possible causes of pyelonephritis. So they are just that. Urinary, in, basically, renal calculi is the fancy word for kidney stones. 
Um, and just know that the stones, we typically, typically call them kidney stones, but they can be found anywhere in the urinary tract. We're not really sure the, ca the exact cause of how a stone is formed. It's, a, it's kind of a crazy concept, but um, essentially they are stones. I don't know if, if you've ever get an opportunity to look at a stone that someone has passed. It literally looks like a little pebble. Um, they are typically related. One of the number one causes for stones formation is poor hydration status. And we'll look at that, um, the causes in the next few slides. So looking at the causes of the development of something called urolithiasis, which is also known as calculi or stone um, in the urinary tract, everyone excretes crystals in their urine at some time, but fewer than 10% of people form stones. So most stones contain calcium, as one part of the stone complex, uric acid, cysteine, and struvite. So that's not really something that you need to memorize or anything. Uh, but they're rare compositions of different things. So it's, that's why it's kind of sometimes difficult to identify the cause. But like I said, one of the typical causes is slow urine flow, which means that the urine has time to kind of sit around. And if there's a lot of these crystals in there, then they can develop stones. So, like I said before, one of the most common causes is poor hydration, which allows for slow urine flow, which allows time for a stone to form out of these uh, crystals. Damage to the lining of the urinary tract can also cause abrasive issues from the crystals, um, and it can help develop stones. There is a metabolic problem that can cause people to be more prone to stone formation. This is when they have excessive amount of calcium absorbed through the intestinal tract, leading to a high calcium levels, um, which could cause the formation of stones with calcium content. Now, that is a very rare and very few proportion of the people who get kidney stones. So there are people who do have some metabolic issue that can cause the stone formation. The other percent of the people that get kidney stones are typically due to poor hydration status. There are a few other metabolic defects that commonly cause kidney stones. They are listed in a table in your book. Um, and it's just important, the, how this would really kind of work is that um, if a patient gets a kidney stone, they would, um, you know, do some diagnostic testing as far as looking at maybe x-rays, ultrasound of the kidneys, maybe um, an IV, a pilogram, which is kind of an x-ray that watches dye go through the kidney to make sure there's no anatomical problem. Um, and if there's no anatomical problem, they will just monitor them. If a patient continues to develop stones, like if they, they every six months they're developing a kidney stone, then they will work that patient up for a metabolic disorder. It's, that's who we might suspect has a metabolic disorder, the people that are getting it more frequently and getting them chronically. So nursing focus. Um, is on pain management and prevention of infection. We also are um, focusing on prevention of kidney stones. So hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And when we talk hydrate, we, we mean hydrate with uh, water, not with Diet Coke, um, you know, not with soda. You, they need to drink water. That's the best way to keep a patient hydrated and keep the urine flow going forward and to rid the body of solutes. If it is determined that the patient has a metabolic disorder that is causing their development of kidney stones, we will need to teach them um, maybe a specific diet. So if it is a calcium absorption problem, then um, they need to avoid high 
doses of calcium. Um, they can eat, you know, they can, they don't have to get rid of it, but they have to avoid high doses of it. They certainly would not be able to take in a supplement because their body's going to absorb it at higher rates. If it's a uric acid problem, um, that is kind of similar to the uric acid with gout. And they will need to decrease their intake of purine sources, and that's your organ meats, red wines, and sardines. There's a good table about this in your book as well. This is just a visual picture for all the visual learners about uh, a kidney stone, renal calculi. It's one of the most painful experiences that a person could possibly have. I like this picture because it kind of shows you where the kidneys sit um, and where the pain typically is. Um, it's usually when the stones decide to move that the patient is going to experience excruciating pain. When those stones try to go through those ureters that are not meant for anything solid to go through, it's meant for urine only, um, it is so severe and very intolerable. Um, can cause even nausea and vomiting. It's usually pain that radiates in a flank area and it'll kind of radiate, it'll start back here and it can kind of radiate around to their abdomen and that's when they start getting nauseated and vomiting. Um, sometimes It's typically a sudden onset of pain. So some of these diagnosis, diagnostic, diagnostic tests listed over here is your analysis, of course. Um, we're gonna look for any urinary tract infection signs or hematuria, which could indicate the movement of a stone. And the hematuria is caused by the stone just damaging the either the kidney or the ureter or the bladder. Cystoscope is a scope that we can um, take. It's a little scope that has a camera on the end of it. We can take it and look, go through the urethra and look into the bladder. That will help us kind of just look at anatomy and kind of help determine what's going on in that lower part of the urinary tract. IV pilogram is a test where we will um, inject dye into the patient's vein and then we will take pictures as the dye goes through the kidneys as it's, um, as it's filtered out through the kidneys. It can help us see um, the structure of the kidneys, see if there's any stone in there and to see if uh, you know exactly kind of what's just going on inside there it gives us a better picture it's important to note that this kind of a test the intravenous urography um, or pilogram is going to um, use dye so we will have to assess your client for allergies to iodine seafood or radiopaque dyes so there is an informed consent involved and you will have to ask those questions Typically, they are um, they hold fluids after midnight the night before the test. Sometimes the injection of the dye can cause some flushing, salty, metallic taste, so it's important to prepare them that it's just the dye and it'll pass very quickly. The nurse's job during the procedure is to monitor the patient's vital signs, um, and typically they'll want the patient to drink at least a liter of fluid after the exam and that helps flush the dye out unless um, the fluid is contraindicated by some other disease process. You also assess the IV site, assess their urinary output afterwards, and assess for any signs or symptoms of a reaction. I think I mentioned KUB earlier. KUB is just a, um, an x-ray that involves the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. There's no prep and typically it's a pretty benign test to do. Stone analysis is going to um, involve just taking a peek at those stones and seeing what they're made of. So that will help us identify whether a patient may or may not have a metabolic disorder causing them to have the stones, which um, could lead to these looking at these levels too, because remember this calcium oxalate or uric acid could be causing the kidney stones. So if their serum levels are high, it could potentially um, make us suspect that they have a uh, metabolic disorder. I also want to mention um, there is a box in your Sylvester NCLEX review book that um, lists nutritional therapy for calculi. Depending on the type of calculi, 
or stone. Um, the diet is modified to decrease foods that are high in the substance that is the cause of the calculi. Olithotripsy um, is a way of breaking down the kidney stones. It's usually non-invasive mechanical procedure for breaking up stones located in the kidney or upper ureter so they can pass spontaneously or be removed by other methods. There are, they are developing different ways to do lithotripsy. Um, there is a percutaneous type where um, for stones that are in the bladder, ureter, or kidney, it's, this is more invasive in which they guide is inserted under fluoroscopy near the area of the stone and an ultrasound wave is aimed at the stone. So it's more invasive than just your typical lithotripsy that uses sound waves. Post-op care is very important, so if it is in a, the percutaneous lithotripsy, of course you're going to monitor the, in the site that the incision um, was made. Sometimes they may put, um, put in a stent to help pass the stones for the patient. Um, so we would have to monitor, basically after these procedures, you want to monitor urine output very closely. Monitor their eyes and nose to make sure that they don't develop a urinary obstruction after this procedure. So if they would were to suddenly um, have very little urine output after the procedure, you would maybe call the provider because they may have developed a blockage and that's why there's no urine able to pass through. You also, they'll have some bruising from these sound waves um, and be a little bit sore, but for the most part, um, it's, it's not a terribly painful procedure, but it is expected that they will have some bruising after the procedure, and you'll just monitor that to make sure that it does get better and not worse. They may have some bleeding in their urine, um, but again, it should get better and not worse, and it should, you know, you monitor it for a large amount of copious blood. That would be of concern. This is a practice question for you to review and attempt to answer, and the answers can be found in the PowerPoint version without a voice posted. Another practice question, and we might review these in class as well, but you can find the answers in the comment section. Here's some surgical interventions that can be done in the event that there is a severe disorder of the urinary tract. Uterostomies is essentially um, typically done in a patient who maybe has to have their bladder removed. Sometimes this can be due to cancer, um, maybe a, an anatomic problem. Um, typically it's bladder cancer, why the patient might have to have their, their bladder removed. But in that event, the bladder can be removed and the ure ureters can be um, taken outside of the body and a stoma can be created where the urine can empty into a bag outside of the body. These pictures, I believe, are straight from your book and so they're just pictures about those procedures that I just spoke about. So they kind of give you a little visual about how these work. Um, and like I said, it's a lot of times due to the fact that um, the kid, the bladder no longer functions and a lot of times it's due to cancer. The next few slides are a case study um, to go through. And I believe the answers are posted in the comment section as well. Um, we can kind of go through this in class too to, to make sure that you understand um, the answers to the, to the questions and the case study. So I encourage you to do these, um, answer these questions on your own, and then we will review the answers and the rationale in class. So bring any questions that you have or anything that you don't understand to class, and we'll discuss this further.